So hello and welcome to the Wasabi Wallet Research Club. Uh, today we are speaking from with Samir from Spiral, uh, which is the title of a fancy cryptography paper of homomorphic value encryption or homomorphic encryption and, and private information retrieval. The, the gist of, of this crypto magic is that a client can request data from a server, so but the server does not know which data was requested. Uh, and uh, there are different variants of the crypto magic for different use cases. And there are currently two proof of concept apps. One is a Wikipedia, uh, so where I think six gigabytes of text entries, no pictures, uh, can be queried so that the server doesn't know which article you're interested in. And the second, more pressing and, and important for us, is an anonymous block explorer so that you can query the UTXO set uh, uh, and, and request an address and the server will give you the, the balance of that address. And well, the, the server doesn't know which address you're actually requesting. So that sounds like impossible magic. <laughs> and Samir, if, 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 please tell us, uh, tell us how, how the magic works. <laughs> Yeah, that's that was a great introduction. Honestly, a little better than the one I had. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, um, that's exactly what it is. That's kind of what got me into this field is that it does sound like magic and it does sound like you you probably shouldn't be able to do something like that, uh, but you can. So, so yeah. Um, I, I'm actually going to just mostly, uh, I'm, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the internals of like how Spiral works at the, at the end, but I'll I'll kind of first just like, Let's just try to situate, you know, the security model of, of a server that doesn't learn what you query is, is kind of complicated. And so let's just first try to compare it to all the other ways you could check a, a Bitcoin balance. And let's just like situate it amongst the many, many alternative ways, you know, one could um, look up the balance of a, of a Bitcoin address. Um, a little background on me, I'm a, I, I was a graduate student at Stanford, um, and this, this PAR project was kind of uh, my senior project uh, for my master's, uh, and I was advised by Dan Bonet, but it kind of, I, I went and got a real job, and so I stopped working on it for a little bit, and uh, then I, the, the itch kind of came back, and I, I worked on this again and published this paper, I believe, yeah, I guess I presented it in May of this year. So um, we're starting the company. I'm quitting my job soon. Uh, so um, yeah, yeah. And we're trying to start a company uh, around this technology. So, all right. So um, today, you know, I think we, you, you, you guys and, and, and me probably have a very similar goal, which is what we want are our private light clients. We want clients that don't have to run a full node, but also do not leak information to third parties or as little information as possible. Um, today, uh, third parties learn a lot of information uh, when you use them directly. So if you're a light client and you just over the regular internet connect to a full node, you are gonna tell them a lot of information. Uh, in particular, they're gonna get both your IP address and your actual you know, Bitcoin wallet addresses as you query them. So uh, that's pretty bad. You know, you're kind of linking this, this very identity correlated feature, uh, an IP address with, with your money. Um, you can use a, a public block explorer to do this instead of connecting to a full node directly, but it's, it's kind of the same picture. Uh, you're still sending your IP address and your wallet address to a third party um, who can link them. A really, a really, good frontline solution is to use Tor. So a very simple thing to do is to, you know, remove this network level identifier, the IP address, um, from the information that the public block explorer gets. Um, there is still kind of like some leakage. And in particular, the leakage is gonna come from the fact that, you know, you, you typically query many more than, than one address. And um, even using something like Tor, even if you actually build a new circuit every time, even if you um, appear to the public block explorer like someone coming from many different clients, uh, you're going to still kind of leak actually the meta metadata, if you will, 
that you know you're querying all these addresses at the same time and over Tor. So uh, we we kind of have to. It, it depends on the actual practical circumstances, but there's still even just timing will lead actually that these addresses are related. Um, and of course, like figuring out that addresses are related is actually a pretty big deal because some of the point of like things like CoinJoin is to actually hide that exact information that the two addresses are controlled by the same person. So um, this linkability problem is, is, is important, uh, we think. There's another solution uh, in BIP 157 and 158. Uh, I think it was implemented by the Neutrino wallet also, which is this block filter solution. So basically what happens here, I'm sure you guys know, but um, is basically compact data about the transactions in each block is kind of streamed to the client continuously. And then when the client sees that a block contains a relevant transaction, it just fetches the full block. Um, so there's like a couple complications with this way of doing things. Uh, one, I guess, practical thing is that the blocks are kind of big. The blocks are one megabyte, up to one megabyte each. And, and for, for kind of privacy reasons, you can't just get a subset of the block. So um, if you are, if you have a wallet that's kind of busy, like if, if you use your wallet, say every hour, you're, you, you have to download a megabyte an hour. So it, it, it's, it's it. as frequently as, as, as your addresses are making transactions, that's, that's how much data you need to kind of stream. Um, the filters themselves are also, you know, a kind of continuous ongoing cost because you got to monitor. Um, so if you're if you go offline for some time, you need to kind of scan through all the filters since you were offline. And then maybe, uh, maybe uh, in a different way, there's there's kind of this leakage problem. So um, one problem is we we the act of fetching the block is not protected. I mean, we 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 announce which block we're we're trying to fetch. But what we do is, I mean, as a mitigation, you know, if we, if we did this all with the same node, that would be bad because the node could kind of pretty easily tell from the blocks that you fetch which address you're interested in. You could just kind of do an intersection attack. It can work quite well. Um, the mitigation is generally that you connect to different peers for each block. So you connect to a different uh, peer to download each block. But, um, you know, again here, the timing really trips us up, right? Again. Just knowing that, uh, just just watching. It, even if I'm not like, even if I'm not a Tor adversary, I'm not able to like, you know, de-anonymize you on Tor. If I'm just like your your university network administrator, and I just watch your bandwidth consumption, I will just notice a one megabyte download on some cadence, right? And if I just like kind of correlate that with with blocks on the chain, then I just kind of see, okay, you, it seems like you might have downloaded block three, seven, nine, and 24. It doesn't become terribly difficult to figure out an address. So there's some leakage. I think I, in all of these examples, the attack I outline is, is kind of theoretical, but it's mostly just to illustrate that there is leakage um, that's, still, that's still kind of there. Um, there are some other options which, uh, people kind of suggest, I don't know if you guys are the audience who would exactly suggest this, I guess industry kind of more, I don't know, the A16Z folks or whatever would say, oh, why don't you just run it on AWS? But of course, kind of just replacing a, a box with a different box, right? Here, now you're just trusting the cloud provider kind of to do everything. Um, and uh, I guess another suggestion folks have is, is running a full node. And I think that, you know, to be honest, that is a great suggestion. If you, if you, if you, um, if you want really sovereign kind of control over the data, I, I think a full running a full node yourself is a good idea. It is just kind of hard. I mean, you have to make it remotely accessible. It's kind of annoying to set up and maintain. Um, if we could find a way without having to run a full node, allow clients to kind of privately query the blockchain, that would still be a good thing because we want to reduce the barrier to entry. We want more people to to use this. So, um, yeah, I mean, there aren't that many full nodes, so so not that many people um, do something like this. So um, the way Spiral works is it uses homomorphic encryption to remove the wallet addresses piece of the query. So the server is still learning your IP address, but now there's no useful data to correlate with that IP address. Um, 
the basic idea is uh, Spiral uses homomorphic encryption to encrypt your query when it leaves your device. And then it's able to kind of process your query and return an encrypted answer um, without um, learning anything about your query. And the guarantee is it's not, it's not statistical. This is not like a mixing or, or any kind of thing like that. This is, it's not like hashing, it's not buckets. It's, it's a full cryptographic guarantee that the server cannot learn anything about the query. So um, even if they're actively malicious. Um, it does incur higher computational costs for the server. In particular, the server has to do work that's linear in the size of the database. So if the database gets bigger, so, so today the database is uh, a bunch of Bitcoin balances. If we wanted to include, you know, when we, when we added transaction data or if we want to include more data, say, about individual transactions, that will make the server's runtime longer. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, the communication is, is, is better and there's kind of no ongoing uh, syncing really needed. The server can kind of keep its database up to date and whenever the client wants to get the most up-to-date information, they can make another query. Um, today, we only support balances and the five most recent UTXOs. And that's because of this thing I talked about earlier where the computational cost for the server is linear in the size of the database. So if we wanted to make it 10 most recent, it would cost more. Um, so we, we need to think carefully about how we can make that kind of scale to at least a use case that's that's useful. And uh, yeah, of course the code is open source and there's a paper and everything. And I'm happy to answer any questions about, about how it works. I have a slide that kind of explains more of the technical underpinnings of, of Spiral. So if you want, I can I can, just go through that slide if you want to hear more about homomorphic encryption stuff. Uh, but before I do that, I'll just kind of say, yeah, I think the open questions for us are, you know, what what minimum set of data is enough? I think balances is on its own is it's not quite enough. I think if I was if, when I run a wallet software, I kind of expect more than just the balance in all my in all my addresses. Um, we yeah. obviously need to think about fetching more than one address. Today, there's like a website and you can fetch one address, but, uh, you know, wallets have more than one address. And, um, yeah, I think there's a couple options on how we do that. Um, we need to think a little bit about the pay or incentivization structure for servers. This is a kind of costly computation, so how can we um, make it feasible or practical for them? And um, long term, I, I think I would like to see an open standard for PIR for this data. So what we want is something that's not tied to a company or, or a person or, or an organization, but just kind of ideally like maybe a BIP or something that um, uh, allows us to not tie ourselves to any particular scheme and, and do this PIR thing um, as an extension of our current way of, you know, say doing a get block RPC or whatever. So, yeah. Um, would you like me to 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 just go through the homomorphic encryption stuff? Because I got I got I got the yes, idea. Would that be interesting? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Max, actually, maybe we can take an intermission just to ask a few questions, and then we'll continue with. Sure, that sounds great. Yeah. Sure. Um, because I think a lot of people are going to have questions here, and uh, um, I'll, I'll just uh, start myself. Can, can you kind of give us a ballpark of the the cost? <coughs> of the server uh, mm -hmm. per UTXO? Sure. So, so uh, I guess today what we do is we take the UTXO set and we kind of summarize it. So today we take the UTXO set and for every address we take the top five UTXOs if there are up to five. And we also compute its balance. And that's the data we, we, we do today. Um, if, if you wanted to say query, the entire UTXO set that would be slightly bigger than than what I outlined, but not not that much bigger. Um, if you want a sense of the the size of the computational cost, maybe the simplest summary would be, you know, for every uh, yeah, I guess uh, if you think of the database size, the computational cost is 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 about three hundred megabytes per second. So what that means is like. If the database is one gig, it takes three CPU seconds to do 
this task. So um, the task is fully parallelizable. So you can think of computation as just a cost. You know, like if you if you did it with three cores, you know, you would take one second. Uh, but yeah, it's it's around three hundred megabytes per second. I see. Um, so the big situation here is that for Wasabi Wallet, um, we would want as like like an MVP for mm -hmm. us to, to work. The uh, the amounts simply wouldn't be enough. Uh, right. uh, our users they want proof. They want to know that it's connected uh, to block headers that are in the, the the chain with the most proof of work. Mm -hmm. um, but on top of that. We also need to know that the server isn't in some ways deceiving us. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> for example, just lowering the balances of all the users or just yeah. omitting certain UTXOs. Uh, block filters do a nice job of, of this because um, you're, you know, you're just hoping the server does an accurate job of creating the filters and mm -hmm. you're querying the blocks and you get these entire blocks. So, you, you know, the only way that you're going to have an incorrect balance is if the server somehow malleates a filter, but there's not really a good, you know, it, it's kind of a weird, um, unclear uh, uh, attack vector. So, um, so mm -hmm. how, how practical would it be to actually get some kind of proofs on, to on top of the balance that, that you, you're already producing? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, 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 um, I'm to get the, the the exact name of this is so so what we want is a Merkle inclusion proof, right? We 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 just want to say that this transaction is part of this block, and to do that, we need the log. If, if n is the number of transactions, we need like log n kind of hashes to show inclusion. Um, I think we use this kind of Merkle proof of inclusion somewhere else, but I'm forgetting. Um, I think there's a wallet that that uses these. Um, but um, yeah, so to include those, that, that would be more costly. And, and yeah, to be clear today, we definitely do not have any kind of limit. You know, there's no proof that the server is, is really serving you the right data. So, so that is a big problem. Obviously, we need to kind of have some proof. Uh, the good news is, yeah, we, we could always add Merkle proofs of inclusion. If you, if you do the math on the size of those, you know, it's like roughly... I think I looked at this before. It was like something like on the order of hundreds of bytes, like maybe 200 bytes or something. Uh, so it would be a significant increase, but uh, possible. I, I, I'll highlight one alternative way of doing this, which is actually suggested in the bit. Uh, in 157. Uh, there, uh, what we could instead do is actually continue to use uh, block filters, but right. use PIR for the block retrieval part. So you would you would retrieve blocks using PIR, uh, but you would use client block filters as normal. I think the problem there is it doesn't save on your bandwidth. I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I, I think most of the bandwidth is coming from the filters and coming from the streaming to the client of the filter data. Uh, so you wouldn't save that. Just as a but, yeah, just as a heads up for you, we're downloading the the filters from our server, like the Wasabi backend server. But then the oh. blocks are downloaded from the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network. So the server okay. doesn't incur the block download cost. Oh, okay. So is the main cost for you guys right now actually the filters because you incur that yes. cost as uh, I see? Yeah, it's a large outgoing cost. I'm sure your hosting provider is is charging you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah, actually doing proofs of inclusion is, is possible, but, uh, yeah, it's good to know. Yeah. You, you need that kind of to deploy this for real. Um, I, what I'm, uh, if I can ask a follow-up question, do you, do you guys, do you guys, um, to do this, do you, are you mostly querying the UTXO set, the full set of transactions, uh, just balances, like what kind of data is, is, is crucial? Uh, we do want the full transaction history list. Yeah. And, and um, so that's what we get in the filters right now. Wasabi is SegWit only, so we don't have to create filters pre SegWit in August 2018 or something, or 17. Okay. Um, yeah. And the filters are as large as the number of uh, BEC32 addresses in the blocks. 
sorry, say that one more the, the filters are mm -hmm. all essentially a compact representation of all uh, BEC32 addresses in a block. Single public key. Right. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Single public key BEC32 addresses. So um, th they're very compact, uh, you know, three years ago because it was a, a, a minority of people use those addresses. <laughs> more and more. Uh, they become larger and larger, but they're 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 very space efficient. Uh, I, I would uh, I don't know the exact details. Uh, maybe Max can answer. But the exact seven hundred megabytes or something. I think it's below a gigabyte. I might be off here, but it's it's not that much. Oh, below a gigabyte for the entire four years. That might be complete bullshit, but I think yes. That, that sounds right. I mean, it's it's not that much data, right? It's it's a because it, it's it's also statistical, right? It's a bloom filter esque thing, right? Uh, it's a that's right. Yes. When it's not exact, uh, um, then there's some false positives, but there are no uh, false right. negatives. That's the yeah. goal. You'll never yeah. miss trust, but you will we, get blocked. Yeah, that that false neg that false positive rate can be configured and the lower you want that false positive rate the larger the filter size is i'm not exactly sure where we fall in the line of, of trade-off here um yeah I, I i don't know details like that lucas is in the call so maybe he knows happy to take any other questions also oh hello guys um it's quite nice to be here uh I don't have any back, um, strong background in crypto and uh, higher order math, but um, as a layman, uh, you know, <laughs> is, is, is there a way to um, simplify the explanation of how homomorphic encryption works? Uh, I have tried to see the, you know, the information on the internet, but uh, it's just not um, possible for a uh, basic, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, layman like me. Would, would that be possible in this call or is it not? Yeah, I, I have a slide. Um, let's let's talk a little bit more about Wasabi Wallet and, and privacy, but then I, I will do, I will I can give that explanation. Is that is that sound good? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, what what I do wonder is um, you you do need to know the inputs. Um, uh, like the um, the value of the UTXO uh, that you're trying to spend, uh, does does your database include amounts? Yes. And how? Yeah. Yes. Um, so so the total size of our database is, is roughly one gig right now. Um, we 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 translate every all UTXOs kind of reduced down to about a gig of data. Um, if we instead make the set all UTXOs and we didn't just take the five most recent ones for every address. Um, yeah, the database would not be much larger. It'd be like a small multiple, like maybe three or four times larger. That would be kind of feasible. I guess what I'm, uh, what I'm thinking about is, I suppose it, it helps that you guys only support the, the BEC32 addresses, because that means um, there's kind of a limited set of addresses that are on chain that have transactions for that. But um, yeah, we need to think about how big would it be to include all transaction history? Because because UTXOs are very different than you know every transaction. <laughs> so um, yeah, okay, it's good to know what the yeah. And, and the, just to just to ask one more time. So the, so the the problem that you guys face with block filters is mostly that you have to download this this gigabyte of of things to get started. Is that the issue mostly? So you have to download, first of all, the server has to generate filters, which can take weeks. Um, then uh, the the clients have to download all the filters, which we do over Tor, um, which also takes, can take, well, an hour, maybe. But then I see, we have right. a lot of... I forgot it's all over Tor. So, so that also... It's, exactly. Yeah. Yes. And then for block downloads, we spin up a new Tor identity for every Bitcoin peer that we download a block from. Uh, so okay. all of this together is, if you have a really big wallet and you're making a full rescan, I mean, it can take a couple of weeks, if not a month. <laughs> I see the issue. Yeah. So, so there, yeah, weeks, if not a month, man. Okay. So 
Hmm. Let, let me just add one more thing. So when, sure. when you when you use Wasabi Wallet, you you're making many addresses, um, uh, because you're you're coin joining, so you have to make a new address every time. And um, if you use the wallet regularly, you might go through something like 300 addresses, or 400, or 1,000 um, sure. over time. That means that what you're looking for in the filters is actually quite broad. Right. Um, and so you get more and more false positives. Um, and so if you, if, you just, if you just think it through, you, you're going to have you know, 1,000 blocks or, or more. And each block is actually more than a megabyte, typically. Um, and so you, you might end up with a gigabyte of, of blocks that you have to query, and each one is queried from a different uh, node over a different Tor so circuit. Not right. necessarily a different node, just a different Tor circuit. Hmm. So, so I guess there are two things to ask here. One is, so, so one thing to note is, you know, it's perfectly fine to use this homomorphic stuff with Tor, you know, like they're kind of orthogonal. Um, one kind of hides your IP and one hides the content of your queries. Doing both is, is probably a good thing. Um, but I wonder if what, what homomorphic encryption could allow you to do is not construct a new circuit like every time. So, the, so if if the query is encrypted, in some sense you don't need to use Tor. But if you if you'd like to also kind of hide your network level identifier, you could do both and use Tor, but not build a new circuit every time, and instead just make many private queries to the same to the same node. Um, this would be presumably faster because Tor circuits can can reach decent bandwidth, right? But not if they're I think freshly constructed every time, right? then you're going to pay the latency. Mm -hmm. uh, can we actually make batch requests with Spiral, like requesting multiple addresses simultaneously? Yeah, yeah. Um, so so if you notice today, no, right? I mean, we just have like a text field with with it, with an address. Um, we we want to support that. Uh, there's there's actually a lot of theory and research about, about doing batch requests kind of more efficiently. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, uh, it's really useful to hear that a very typical use case is like hundreds of addresses, because that says a lot about how we need to build this to make it usable, you know? Um, so yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so, so batching is possible. It's, it's, uh, but it's in the works. Yeah. Yeah, by the way, it's it's way more than just a thousand. Uh, I'm, I'm checking a, a not even that old wallet, um, and it has, well, uh, 8,000 addresses. Here's 13,000 addresses. Wow, so since okay. we do, you know, we do, we attempt many coin joins, and a lot of them fail, and we generate new addresses for each attempted coin join, and you can register up to eight outputs in a, in a round. So let's say a round fails, I don't know, five times before it succeeds. So that's five times eight addresses um, mm -hmm. that, that we, we have to add to your gap limit. I see. So, so it, are the, are the addresses that you, that you create there, do they, are they unspent? Are they, do they contain any, I mean, if no. you, if you create an address and no one hears about it, did it, did it really get created? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, in this case, yes, because the coin join coordinator hears about it. Ah. And right, probably okay, so also the other coin join signers. So it's semi public ish. Yes, but did it never did, will it store uh, value? It will, right? I guess to start the coin join, it, it had to have some, mm -hmm. some value in it. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, sorry. So we spend inputs that, that are addresses with money on them. But then on the output side, we create new addresses uh, that are not yet used without money on it. Uh, oh, so I see. So they're most... the empty output addresses. Exactly. Those are addresses that never were on the blockchain in an output with any amount of stats. It's just unused addresses, so to say. Mm -hmm. So then those would not need to actually hit any kind of... They, they, we don't need to query the blockchain for them at all, right? Well, well but the client doesn't know if that address is empty or not. Right? So we need to query all of them. Just a lot I of see, them, the I server see. will say there's nothing on here. I see, I see. 
Yeah, so an easy way to actually resolve that will be to actually just make a set of addresses that have any money. So, so you yeah. know, <laughs> this is a technique we actually use for the for the current service. What you can do is instead create another database that just says like, does this address have any money at all? Um, uh -huh. And uh, that that database can be can be very small, right? Because again, we can use like the classic bloom filter thing where we, it's not quite a bloom filter because the addresses are already random. So just take the X top, top X bits of every address that uh, has money in it and send these to the client or That's allow cool. them to fetch them using PAR, right? So, um, yeah. And Wasabi Wallet already handles the mempool, right? Um, you guys already like, kind of privately listen to everything on the mempool and, and then cross-reference it with the addresses you have and all, and all that, so. Yeah, we build a local mempool. The issue is when we're offline, we of course don't know it. So maybe actually some private information retrieval over someone else's mempool might be another interesting mm. use case. Mm. Yeah, so. <laughs> Um, so, sorry, a, a bit more about the batched requests. So, like, yeah. would it be possible to just send 10,000 addresses uh, to, this, to the server and he responds in a single uh, package? So, it's definitely possible. I mean, the simple way is, yeah, you can send 10,000 queries, you can upload them all, and then just kind of the server can just do all the computation and send you all the responses. The problem is going to be, well, the problem is going to be twofold. One, there's a significant cost to to running a, a, a query. So a query costs today like six CPU seconds, right? So six CPU seconds, it's not nothing, but it's also, it's something, you know, like it's it's a, it's a significant cost. So, so 10,000 addresses times six CPU seconds is 60,000, it's, you know, mm -hmm. 60,000 hours of computation. Uh, so it'll be tough. Uh, so what, in order to, to make that work, to make 10,000 addresses work, what we need is to, is to do batching or reduce the number of addresses that we're effectively querying by, you know, like I said, like figuring out whether the addresses are empty or, um, you know, kind of reducing the set that way. Um, but yeah, 10,000 is, is hard. Um, <laughs> the other thing is going to, the other problem is going to be communication. So like every query is, is, is 14 kilobytes. So 10,000 times 14 kilobytes is, you know, a lot. And then, uh, that's a lot of 140 megabytes to upload. So it's, that's, yeah, it's not going to be that feasible. Um, yeah. Actually, to this, I have a question because I, I saw on the website that the first request, the client mm -hmm. needs to send more data and for every following, it's less. But yes, why is that? yeah. Yeah, it's because um, the, the first request uh, contains what's called like the setup data or the public parameters. Basically, the server sends essentially like an extended, like a large public key to the server. So the server uses this this public key to kind of uh, let it do the the query processing. Um, so it's it's uh, it's state that the server needs to store on a per client basis, but it's not. Uh, it has no privacy implication. It's just uh, used for the homomorphic processing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's big, and it you you might have noticed it's pretty big. It's like eight megabytes or something. And does that size depend on the database size? It does not, or it, it mm -hmm. uh, extremely, it only logarithmically does. So it's like very, it's, I mean, like if the database was a hundred times bigger, it would be like 12 megabytes or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I mean, uh, hmm. just general, like it's yeah. a very broad question, but is it, so if we want to have the, the full TX outset of mm -hmm. all, like of, oh, but actually no, we probably also want transaction IDs and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. So basically we want the full transaction metadata blockchain thing for all SegWit and Taproot outputs. Yep. And let's say uh, we have, I don't know, 
10,000 users or so, and each of them has, let's say, a thousand addresses or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I, and this is still rather <laughs> small scale, but is it? Yeah. Like, is this completely crazy or is it something? Yeah, no, no, no. You, you're asking a very, a very good question. So, so I think that the way that it's not, so, so that's, that's very true. So, so I think like it is difficult, especially from a cost perspective, I think for the, for the server, it's difficult to see this scaling to, I check 10,000 addresses kind of regularly. Like every, you know, every day I check 10,000 addresses and there's like 10,000 users, you know, that, that will quickly become difficult for the server. But I think there's two things. One is the set of active addresses is not 10,000. So what can we do to kind of like reduce the number? Two it is just a cost for the server. You know, computation is just money as we as we know from proof of work, right? So a question is, you know, if clients were willing to pay for it, if I was willing to pay for six CPU seconds for my query, maybe that would be okay. I might not be willing to pay 10,000 times six uh, CPU seconds. So we'd, we'd have to see what clients are kind of, you know, quote unquote, willing to pay. Um, and then also, I, I guess the last thing I would say is it is it would be very feasible to use PAR just for blocks. So if you think that the privacy leakage is an issue or you're interested in in that kind of angle on it, I think just doing PAR, just just in that block retrieval phase of the standard client block header thing, if you want to do PAR, I think that is 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 very, very feasible. One 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 other thing. Um, I think that uh, there's kind of like a there's also like a kind of narrow use case for just like onboarding or or just like setup. I think if you're like a client is setting up and it's taking weeks <laughs> to <laughs> sync your wallet, I think it's really powerful that in the meantime you can you can make queries uh, for for addresses. You can see if you've been paid. Um, privately. Yeah, exactly. Right. To just get the active wallet balance really quickly. And yeah, the, so no syncing, no longer. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so actually it might, it might even make sense just as a kind of, yeah, as a fallback or even kind of as a like setup thing. I mean, the fact that you don't incrementally have to do anything, like each query costs the same and, so, or I guess the first one costs a little more, but, but basically there's no syncing, right? There's no like, client state that I'm trying to get into sync with the chain, I, I'm just kind of, I can make a query kind of one-off. Something I noticed is, can, can you query the balance of an address that's not in your wallet today? I, I think you can add a public watch address, but you can't, you can't actually use it like a block explorer, right? Yeah, you cannot. And the problem is you would have to run this address through all the filters, download all mm -hmm. the past false positive blocks. And so it would take. I don't a long know if that's time. a feature. Yeah, I don't know if it's yeah. a feature you guys are interested in, but I I think it would be useful to be able to just say, "Hey, what you know, like, yeah, how much is at this address?" Because today, mm -hmm. you know, the option is to go to a Chrome tab and type it in and like send it to, you know, who knows, um, send it to blockchain.com or whoever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and by the way, the, um, if you receive a transaction and you want mm -hmm. to then you don't know the inputs of that transaction. So mm -hmm. you, or sorry, the input amount of that transaction, because that's on the blockchain, not in the transaction itself, right? It's on the previous transaction output. Um, right. And and then you cannot do effective fee bumping in a child pays for parent transaction. Right? Because oh, you, you'd, uh, so this is an issue that we have of kind of quote unquote stuck payments that you received. And maybe something like that might be helpful. And so you, you can query the amount of that input and then do better fee bumping. I see. I see. So, so, so to summarize, like you're, you, you have a, you have a, you know, you received a payment, but you just don't know how much it is essentially because you, that information is just kind of not local. Um, no, no you, so you, you receive a transaction 
where on the output side your address is. That's why the transaction was hit in the, in the filter. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you don't know the value of the inputs exactly oh, right? because that's okay. in the previous transaction output. So you don't know the the fee rate that this current transaction has. Ah, and so you, you know don't that know it's less than or transfer. equal to, but you don't you don't know uh, what what gap was yeah. left for the miner in in the form of the fee. I see exactly, and then you can't do child pays for parent fee calculations. Yeah, so that is a yeah that is. It's just one of those edge cases where we thought it would be nice to be able uh, to just well search for an address, yeah. but then we realized yeah it'll take minutes you know be hours. Right, I think um, I think it, yeah. So so long term, I guess I have a slide on this, but um, oh no, um, I think long term uh, we would like to build a like an SDK. So that we're not kind of like individually hand engineering the homomorphic encryption, but so that it's kind of a totally generic thing. So, so the, the dream is that there's like a piece of code that you point uh, a bunch of like a, basically an array at, and then there's an endpoint that you can privately query that data using. So um, certainly for like all these kinds of smaller things that you want to do, that really really kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm, definitely. Oh yeah, by the way, um, to jump back, so you say the client needs to upload his quote-unquote public key to the server. Mm -hmm. So then all the queries are connected to the same public key? So all of the queries are made using the same, uh, yes, they're, they're, each query is connected to the same, let's say, key pair. Um, the, the crucial part is that every query is encrypted. So it's encrypted under this key. So it's it's not uh, the queries are I guess are identifiably from the same party, but what the queries are for is not. So I guess there's some there you're, you're right. There's some meta metadata almost that's uh, that's still visible, right? Because you can see, I guess uh, the the main leakage is timing. So you you can see that some party made five queries over this period of time. I see. So if you would want to go extreme and even hide this type of metadata, then we'll use a different public key or, or key pair yes. each time. Yes. So then yes. that means upload more data for every query. Yes. And then yes. do some That's randomization the and the timing as well, plus new Tor circuits. And then it yep. gets a lot more inefficient as well. Right? Yeah, um, some, 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 some mitigations for timing are just pacing. So, so a simple thing you can do is just kind of like uh, just pace requests and uh, send dummy requests. Uh, but yes, obviously these incur costs. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, today, if you want to do the same thing for block filters, you 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 are kind of stuck in that, I mean, the timing alone of your request is going to kind of correlate them. So um, yeah, it is kind of a tough problem. That's why batched requests are also very important, I would say. Yeah, yeah, certainly a batch request where we round up the size. So like, uh, it would be important to kind of like not reveal the exact number of addresses you have in your wallet, just because that is probably kind of identifiable. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, if we just if we just round up the number of addresses and let you query, you know, up to X thousand addresses at a time, uh, yeah. Hmm. I will um I will do some more research and thinking on batching. It's very useful. Thank you so much for like talking to us and, and letting us hear like your problems and stuff. Um I think it would be useful to go back and look at batching and see if it can be practical. Super cool. So then let's like how how long does then the a request take like so let's say we want to look up a thousand addresses or so mm -hmm. how long does the client have to wait the client has to wait for as long as it wants to for almost directly in proportion to how much it's willing to pay <laughs> so i mean uh if we want to make a thousand a thousand queries right let's say it's it's uh you know five thousand seconds of, of computation right uh if you pay the server uh as you know computation is like kind of cheap and parallelizable. So you can imagine a server, especially like it starts to look basically like a cloud provider or something. 
that just goes, okay, if you pay me 5,000 times one cent or, you know, 0.1 cents or whatever, I'll, I'll process your query in one second. Cause I'll just throw 5,000 cores at it. Uh -huh. um, so, so it is kind of, it, it is infinitely divisible. It's, it's naively parallel as an algorithm. So. That's really interesting to hear. Hmm. So, I think yeah, there's a nice, yeah. There's an interesting intersection with the fact that this is all for a payment system, right? <laughs> so it would be Definitely. interesting to think about, yeah. Okay, I think I'm pretty much out of questions for now. Does anyone else have any? No, then it would be nice to get a bit more into the, the crypto magic, if you could get Sure, sure. Right. I, I'm, uh, if, if this altitude is, is kind of too much or too little, let me know. Um, the slide is kind of, <laughs> kind of gross looking, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just walk through, uh, I'll walk through the basics of how this works. So here's how this kind of works on the inside. So, so basically, remember, we have a client uh, and a server, and we'd like, the client would like to retrieve an item from this database of items without letting the server learn which one uh, it queries. So basically, if we imagine our index is, is three, like we want the third item of the database, what we're going to do is we're going to have the client create a kind of bit vector, so a vector of bits. Uh, if you remember linear algebra, I'm using the word vector kind of on purpose. So it's a you know column vector of bits where it's a one hot encoding. If you've been around machine learning, you might have heard the term one hot before, but basically that means there's a one in the location that I want to retrieve and zeros everywhere else. So uh, there's a zero in these entries and there's a one uh, at the desired index. So I'm going to form this this vector. It's just a plain text bits on on my client, and then I'm going to encrypt each of them. So I'll explain, you know, the, the encryption we use has a special property, um, which we'll get to. But basically, it, it, it is also, it behaves mostly like a normal encryption scheme. So you encrypt each bit. And now these, you know, these encrypted bits get sent to the server. And just like if you AES encrypted them, uh, the server can't tell what any of these bits encrypt. Uh, it's kind of crucial to remember that, like, you know, the encryption of zero and the encryption of zero, they they don't look the same. Every time you encrypt zero, you get a different looking random thing. Uh, and the server cannot uh, kind of distinguish whether you encrypted the same thing or a different thing. So, th so that property applies. It's, it's called uh, chosen plain text security or, or semantic security. But basically, yeah, you know, this vector of encrypted bits, it's not uh, visible to the server which ones are zero or which ones are one. Uh, so that gets sent to the server. And then how does the server actually figure out uh, the answer to your query? Well, uh, if you view, if you look at the plain text database elements in green, it does this kind of special, this is the special property of the encryption. Um, the encrypted zero gets multiplied by the plain text, you know, eight here. And what we get is the encrypted product of them. So if we multiply encrypted zero by six, we'll get zero. If we multiply encrypted one by seven, we'll get encrypted seven. So the, the point is this, this, this ability to do this multiplication, that's not normal. <laughs> normal encryption doesn't let you do that. So if you AES encrypt zero and then like multiply by eight, you will just get garbage. There's no, it does not become like encrypted zero. Um, this uh, is- uh, what's, Sorry. Yeah, the, on, on the left and right hand side, the number four, E zero times eight equals E zero. Is, mm -hmm. is the two times E0, is that the exact same thing or just a different encrypted blob with the same zeros clean text? It, it is not the exact same thing. So uh, do, you mean, do you mean on the left and right, like this encrypted zero and this encrypted zero? Yes. Yeah, so, so they are not the same thing. Um, they actually, again, to the attacker, look completely indistinguishable and random. So they, they both look... What they what they encrypt looks completely uh, hidden to the attacker, uh, to to any to the server. Nice, thanks. Continue, yeah. please. So, so then you can add up. You can do the same thing, just like we we multiplied. You can also you're allowed to add. So, if you add encrypted zero and encrypted seven, you get encrypted seven. 
uh, and so on. So you kind of add all of the results and now you have a single encrypted result that you can send back to the client. The client can decrypt and get the item that it wanted. So th this is how it's kind of, let's say possible to do this. Um, you should, there's, there's probably one glaring problem with this toy example, which is that we uploaded in our query the same number of elements that, as are in the database. So our query is very, very big, you know. Uh, so that that's a problem. So so in the real scheme, there's kind of a whole bunch of complicated stuff you can do to mitigate that. Basically, you can kind of structure the database as a cube and kind of send bits that correlate to each kind of dimension or axis on the cube, and then you can multiply and reduce that way. Um, and that makes the query smaller, you know. So, but uh, this is the gist of it. This is how it works. So the point is now you can maybe conceptualize how if there was an encryption scheme that did these things, then you could do PIR. You know, if there was an encryption scheme that had this, this multiplication and this addition operation, then it would all work. So then the question becomes, okay, well, how do you get an encryption scheme like that? It's not something that AES does. It's not something that e even ECC really does. Um, so um, yeah, the process of getting that is, is, is more involved, but that's the gist of, this is the gist of how, how this scheme works. Any questions? I'm, I, I know it's like a super, it's complicated. So I'm happy to answer anything. I haven't given this talk that many times, so it's a little, I'm happy to answer anything. Yeah, that's, it's pretty nice. Um, the, the data size in number four for the orange mm -hmm. boxes on the right. So E0, E0, E7, E0 is, mm -hmm. and then underneath the sum of E7 again. So the is the data size of these orange blobs different, especially the sum? Yeah, it's a great question. So no, so all the encryption, all the orange blocks have the exact same size. So that's a very good point, you know, like this vector of encrypted zeros and ones, it's it's not small, right? Because every one of them is is big enough to hold a plain text element. So it's 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 pretty big. There are a bunch of things you can do to kind of not actually send uh encrypted zeros and encrypt so I guess I can I can just I can just explain it this way. Um so the operations we have are, are, are homomorphic multiplication by a plain text item, and um, like here, and addition. I don't know your familiarity with like in your algebra or something, but that's that's a, that's a not quite complete set. If if you were also able to multiply two encrypted numbers, you can kind of do the you can think about it and, and see that actually you can compute any function on encrypted data if you have addition and multiplication. You know, addition and multiplication kind of every computation is like a composition of, of adding and multiplying, right? Our, our, all our computers do are, are add and multiply. So um, there's a, there, are, there are ways to kind of uh, compute an arbitrary function on encrypted data. So what that means is the, the query is now much smaller and you perform this arbitrary computation to make all of these encrypted zeros and ones in a big way while keeping the query small. So, um, yeah. What's up, Jumar? Okay, uh, this is where I saw this um, um, illustration in sure. because um, sent me the, <laughs> the link to it before. Uh, my question is, um, what is the mathematical principle that um, enables this? Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit familiar with linear algebra, so that's sure. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 the main principle is that uh, it's difficult to kind of uh, invert matrices when they have noise. So I can say more about that, but basically... What that means is like, if you have a matrix, a large random matrix, and you multiply it by a vector, 
the outputs are are easy to determine. Uh, the output and the input vector are kind of correlated. It's easy to invert the matrix and figure out what the input was from the output. So if you have A, S, uh, you know, if I give you A, S and I give you A, it's easy to find S because finding the inverse of a matrix is not hard. But the, the key insight, the algebraic insight that like enables this is that uh, well, if I give you A S plus E, where E is just some very small noise, uh, suddenly the problem is very hard. It's very hard to figure out S from A S plus E. Um, the post has, I think, like further down kind of uh, a discussion of like learning with errors and stuff. Uh, in in programming, we have this um, concept of um, you know in I I triple E floating numbers. Mm -hmm. There's uh, epsilon. Was mm -hmm. it? Is that related to that E? Like um, no, but in, no. So so it's not like super small. I mean, when I say small, I don't mean like infinitesimally small, like epsilon. I just mean that it's small relative to the size of the of the of the data. Yeah, so it's just, it's small enough that when the client decrypts, it can kind of round away the error. So you can think of it, it's less like epsilon, more like like error. Like, you know, like that floating point error where you add like 1.0001 yeah, and yeah. 1.0001 and you get two, you know, because of that floating point error. It's, it's kind of analogous to that. It's more like there's kind of this small error that you can ignore at the end. Um, also, to Max's point, I remember I, I forgot to mention something which is interesting, which is you, you asked whether this left and right thing are, are different. And they are. To the attacker, they're indistinguishable. But something that is happening that is kind of interesting is that each ciphertext contains noise. So what's happening every time we do one of these operations is the noise inside the ciphertext is growing. And when I say noise, it kind of sounds fuzzy, but, but basically there's noise inside every ciphertext. And as you do operations to it, noise grows. And when the noise is too big, uh, when you decrypt, you'll get the wrong answer. You'll get an incorrect decryption and you won't know it. Um, so, so, so part of it is that the, there is something happening when you do these multiplications and these additions, the noise is growing. You can't do it an unlimited number of times. Um, otherwise the ciphertext will kind of become garbage. Yeah. Okay, that's that's uh, that's uh, the way you explained it in uh, in the terms of matrices. Uh, yeah, I think it's it clicks something on me. <laughs> you know. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah feel um, free to uh, reach out if you have other questions. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, another thing is that um, how um, how do you get this? Kind of noise it does it um you know when you deal with the floating numbers you know just a little bit of noise can throw off calculations like in physics and stuff um how is that dealt with with this um uh, encryption scheme yeah it's a good question so so we um yeah i mean for the the the, the noise we use is sampled from the gaussian distribution so like a normal distribution um and what we do is like we kind of before we run a computation, we kind of almost like predict or check ourselves. We check, okay, if we do this computation, what's going to happen to the noise distribution? And we kind of calculate like a, a bound. Uh, uh, we calculate the standard deviation of the noise distribution at the end uh, in advance, and we make sure that you know the. Uh, we, we make sure that the noise distribution is is n not so wide as to make the ciphertext like unreadable as to you know like cause an error in the in the decryption so basically what we do is we bound the standard deviation of the output noise and by by doing that we can we can say you know the noise will always be within six standard deviations of the mean and we know the standard deviation is going to be x and so we know that uh we will decrypt correctly. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, that's all for me. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Hello, guys. Hello. Hey, Adam, glad that you're here. Catch the recording, it was very good. Um,
I, I do have another question, and that is um, about the. So I saw the client on GitHub and, and mentioned that this mm -hmm. is free open source. What about the server? Yeah. <laughs> so the server does not need to be open source, but uh, because of like homomorphic encryption guarantees. But I think we still are open sourcing it. So uh, the server is at uh, my GitHub. Uh, it's at this one. I think this is our old repo. So I can message it in the chat. So there is a server here. So so we also have uh, the server uh, open source in public. I do think that the uh, the the really crucial part is to get kind of reproducible builds and stuff on the client because the client, as long as you trust the client, everything else is is fine. So um, yeah, but obviously for an open standard, we're going to need open source clients and servers. Cool, thank you. So I just arrived. Is there a way to 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 summarize how spiral work in a, like like I'm five? That's magic. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I think the summary, the best summary, is honestly Max's at the beginning, which was just like basically spiral is a way to retrieve an item from a database without letting it ever learn what item you retrieved. And okay. the way it works well, is kind of complicated, but, 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 yeah, but let, let's just, what does that mean? Like... <laughs> okay, okay, I can, I can do a little, I can, I can explain a little more. So, so yeah, um, the way it works intuitively is basically the client sends this kind of encrypted vector of bits and the server does like a encrypted dot product between the bits that the client sends and the items in the database. And the point is, you know, uh, the one bit will kind of be the item that we want and the zero bits will kind of cancel out all the items we don't want. And the server will add these all up and send it back to the client. And the point is the server never learns, you know, what the encrypted bits were. It never learns what the sum of everything was. Uh, it just kind of, does the computation and sends the encrypted result back to the client. Oh, okay, okay. So it's like a cryptographic challenge protocol. That's, uh, that's like you, uh, the server is sending bytes, but those bytes are not the address, but somehow with the client server challenge, you can, you can establish the address or, or or the information that the yeah, server yeah, is sending exactly. on the client. Holy shit, that's yeah. That's so, something. so it's basically yeah. So the client is sending an encrypted version of its query, and it gets an encrypted response. And the point is, the server never decrypts anything. Yeah, that's the point. Everything stays encrypted. So it's kind of like it's almost like end-to-end -end encryption. <laughs> like so, you, so you send something out and get it back. The catch is that it's it's uh, expensive for the server to do the computation. So, you know, the server has to invest a lot of effort to kind of answer your query. So you might need to eventually pay them or like in some way incentivize their, their behavior. How expensive? Is it so expensive as for the entire Bitcoin transaction history mm -hmm. uh, blockchain? wouldn't be able to run on a single server no matter how big you are trying to buy? It's a good question. Uh, I mean, it used to be impossibly big. It used to be like, you know, I would say years, you know, to do a single Bitcoin address lookup. But um, today it's not so bad. So today there's been a lot of innovation. Today you can look up a balance of an address today at our site, uh, like, very easily and our, our server costs I think like 50 bucks a month to run or something it's not an expensive server that we run uh, so today it's not too bad uh, I think doing all of the transaction history is definitely more costly but it's still not it's not like infeasibly costly I think it gets maybe really bad if you are trying to query you know tens of thousands of addresses 
then we'll have to think of a better way uh, to kind of batch your, your queries. Yeah, so Adam, there's multiple layers of why this isn't, might be very difficult for us to use. One is we might want the transaction history. So this is the whole TX outset instead of the UTX outset. We, we definitely want that. So we cannot get that. We could, but then the size of the database gets larger because you need to store all outputs, not just the unspent ones. And so that's the first issue. The second okay, issue so, is because, but how how large like so large that we cannot run on a server or we can buy that big server for it I mean come on like like seriously if this is the issue and and we could buy a server for it like I think it would be worth it because you know this is the single most problematic thing that we have performance-wise in, in Wasabi Wallet. This is why we are not like, like, like Blue Wallet. This is, this is the reason. And, and if it would be feasible, then I, I, I think it would be worth it. But let me try to summarize the complexity of why it might still not be feasible. Right, so yeah, there are other. Uh -huh. Exactly, there are others, right? So one is the size of the database. The, the other is the number of addresses that a single client is looking for. Uh, and well, my client often has over 10,000 used addresses. And so you would need to query all of them. And not just once, but every time you load the wallet. And so we have, I don't know, 10,000 users with each 10,000 addresses making queries over the entire blockchain database, so to say. That's that turns very expensive very quick. Uh, and how, however, a solution around this is... You would have to only do it once. Well, next time you open the wallet, you might have received a coin to one of those many addresses. Oh, oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, yes. So, mm. so I think, like, the, yeah, there's a couple kind of layers of... So yeah, Max and I went through this. There, there's a couple layers of kind of mitigation you can do. So, so one layer is you can you can also just look at which addresses were, because of kind of this homomorphic encryption thing, because you can query kind of arbitrary data as long as the server kind of forms it for you. Um, you could have a database that says, when were these wallets last interacted with? And you could just query that database and you could find out, okay, none of my wallets or, you know, 9,000 of these addresses were not, nothing happened on them in the last, since I last opened this app, right? And then for the thousand that are remaining, you could look and see, you know, which, uh, which ones of them have a balance still or are still active. And then you could retrieve each of their transaction histories kind of individually. Um, it's not perfect, but something I'll do is I think I will... <laughs> I will try to build up a number of addresses in my wallet that's large enough to kind of test with. And I, I would love to play around and, and, and see how, how this could work, or at least, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a kind of urgent challenge. So um, yeah, uh, and it's, it's cool tech. So. Mm -hmm. Another interest, like the, the cool thing is like private information retrieval from a database is it seems massively big, like as a concept, and we can use it in many different areas. One, for example, might be to query the mempool of someone else, which you, you boot up your client and, and you have unconfirmed transactions, and this way you could be able to, to get them. So I did that in, in Hidden Wallet. I was querying the entire mempool of all the nodes I'm connected to, but it got, got expensive pretty fast. If you're, if you're interested in the, in the, in the like checking addresses you don't own, um, I think that's also very feasible. I don't know if that's interesting, but um, I think that today your options are pretty bad. So I think, I think at least on that front, yeah. We're, 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 we're kind of clearly better than, than, than the best way you have today. 
to, to kind of look up the address of a, of a balance that you don't already have in your wallet of, of an address. So that is a super important point and that might... Hmm. So what are people looking in Block Explorers? They are looking, looking at uh, quite a few things there. But, but building a private Block Explorer is uh, based on this protocol might actually be, be possible. And, and yes, that's a huge, huge, huge thing, like re really huge. Right now, people are putting in, and people, I mean, like, I do that as well. And so we are putting in our, our addresses in Block Explorers to check if everything is going well or uh, mm -hmm. how well was constructing Wasabi this transaction, <laughs> stuff like that. And, uh, well, that's a, that's a huge database that Block Explorers have. Um, so that's that's pretty problematic. I hope like it's not gonna be like that well known fact that they are going at going for block explorers to 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 disclose data, you know. Yeah, I, I mean if I was I would definitely subpoena a block explorer. <laughs> I think uh I think Ledger keeps keeps their logs on Ledger Live for like five years or something. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, uh, yeah, I don't know if you guys are interested. I think that's another angle we're interested in is this hardware wallet kind of integration. I think it's kind of funny how you go to kind of, you, you're currently able to go to great lengths and kind of keep all your private keys on hardware. But then when you want to just like know how much money you have, you have, kind of have to you kind of have to just, you end up kind of just going to a block explorer and, or Ledger or whoever, and kind of just telling them your address and your IP address and stuff. So, yeah. So um, you could connect it to your own node, right? I guess. Yes, yes. To it and stuff, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, okay. guys. Especially even, for, for even mobile this, clients and stuff. Yeah, no, go ahead. You know, even when you connect to your own node, which, which is something you brought up earlier, but the, pro the problem with this is you still put your sensitive information on another computer. And, and sure, you're the one mainly in control of that computer, but maybe you get hacked or maybe you are already hacked. And so the, the less information you store in someone or on another computer, the, the better. Like an existing example is Electrum X versus Electrum Personal Server. Electrum Personal Server stores your extended public key on the server versus Electrum X only receives an address and then forgets it later. Right, so if someone walks into your your house and, and takes your Electrum personal server, he knows your XPub. Versus if he takes your your Electrum X, he he knows nothing. So this is better in, in the sense like I would want to run a, a, a Spyro block explorer on top of my own node, just so that if someone gets hold of my computer, he he still doesn't know anything. Yeah, I, I think another way to think about it would be you know if you want to just kind of like not do the management, but get all the privacy. I think this is the way to do it. If you run Spiral in AWS, you know, like you can be very confident that they don't learn anything about what you query, uh, but you also don't have to like take it with you when you move and figure out your ISPs, like, you know, static IP situation so you can use it on your phone when you're going somewhere or, you know, something like that. So if I understand it correctly, the reason why we cannot use it is because th there are two, two problems here. First, if we want to have the entire transaction history of an address, then we would have to run a server that might be too big for us. Uh, like there is no such a server existing in this world to, to run that. And this question could be investigated, right? And the other issue is that when you have tens of thousands of addresses, like it is taking long 
to make those tens of thousands of of uh, cryptography key challenge exchanges to to figure out the entire transaction history. So this is this might be taking like half an hour or or how how long? If I may add something, you can have multiple servers, let's say in Amazon, and running them in parallel, right, with Spiral on. So it should be costly, but still more fast. I mean. Yeah, Adam, for, yeah. for your info, this is a, a CPU heavier, but it's paralyzable. So if we get a server with 50,000 CPU cores, then it would be super quick. And you can have multiple of them. But I don't think that's that's needed, right? If you can just multiply CPU cores. There, is, is there a speed difference between having two servers with each five CPU cores versus one server with 10 CPU cores? No, not really. I think I think uh, you'll run into memory at some point. I mean, you'll 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 want to you know you'll start thinking. Okay, well, if I put if you put five thousand cores on a system with eight gigs, you might get you might get bottlenecked by other things. So, so there is kind of a a thing. I will say I don't think it's super feasible. It's you know CPUs are cheap, but they're not that cheap. So <laughs> I don't want to. I think I. I agree with kind of Max's assessment that that for this to be feasible, we we need to find a way to um, do this for large numbers of addresses, and not have it be like you know dollars per lookup, you know, like like significant amount of money per lookup. Because I think that's that's if the goal is to lower the barrier to entry and to like make it better, right? That's that's going to be a, a roadblock. It's going to be tough to to want to pay a dollar every time you want to know how much money you have, you know. So um, I I I believe we we can work on this. I, I'm not I'm not I, I haven't lost all hope. Uh, I think it's really useful to hear that that people have so many addresses, and I want to know more about like what those addresses look like. I, you you kind of explained that they're kind of the outputs of a of a, their output addresses as a result of a coin join, uh, sometimes a failed coin join. Uh, but um, yeah, the more I can kind of understand that, the more I think it, it would be, it, it could be feasible kind of to, to, to make progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I would guess the vast majority of these addresses are unused, so they never made it on the blockchain. And okay. then on, only a well, a rather smaller number made it on the blockchain and is already spent, and so not in the UTXO set anymore. And then mm -hmm. the smallest percentage is going to be the the un uh, uh, the unspent UTXO addresses. Okay, okay. Lucas. Certainly, I mean, spent. So, so something cool about spent coins is that, like, you know, once they're spent, they can't kind of come back, right? So, uh, yeah, we can kind of exploit that. Um, okay. Lucas, what's your take about all this? Um, can we use Pira somehow, if not even if it's... Uh, can, can we use, use it to, to make Wasabi like really light? Or... Or, or even should we, even if we could work it out, like you, you are the one who wrote the Gnome Rights Theater stuff, so you put a lot of thoughts into around here. Uh, honestly, I don't know. Uh, I would like to know more about the, the technology, but when I entered into the, 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 the meeting, they were already discussing things that i mean how to how to use the technology but know what the technology really is um, so i try to do my best to understand basically what i think is the technology is clearly good right um so and i'm sure there are many scenarios that we can many problems we used to have can be solved by this, uh, but I don't know 
exactly how can we use it for our, um, let's say, for reconstructing our local UTXO set. I mean, the UTXO set um, that is relevant for the wallet, right? And all the transactions and all the information. I, I cannot see it. Um, basically because the problem that we have is for mainly for new users, right? Or users that have to, for some reason, to resynchronize the, 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 the wallet. But I use the wallet more or less frequently, right? And it takes nothing for me to, to open, to synchronize. It's just, to me, it's, it's exactly the same as Blue Wallet right? <laughs> it's very good. Uh, so, um, I think it, no, I think it, it doesn't worth the effort to, even if it, it, even if the technology, no, no, the technology, even if the, the requirement of the technology in terms of bandwidth, uh, storage, CPU, even if, if we can afford that, I, I don't know if we can afford to, to change the architecture of the wallet to, to use this technology, right? And even if we can afford all of that, I don't know if the result will be so good because we have to do a lot of requests, lots. And, and, and the process of discovering the wallet is, is, is the same, right? I don't know what's the keys. So I have to query one key, one key, one key, one key, one key, and I, I, we will discovering that, oh, well, now I have to try with the next 21 keys or the next, I don't know, some of our users have minimum gap limit of, I don't know, 600, I don't know. So I have to, to query the next 600 keys. No, I, 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 I don't think it, it, is, it is possible. However, I'm sure, uh, this is something because you know the PI, PIR um, um, technologies have been improving a lot, and now it seems this is like this is like something great, a great ach achievement, right? Before first time I I, I read something about this, uh, mm -hmm. three servers were required for for this mm -hmm. because one server keep one table, the others server keep a different kind of information it was a really mess but now it's getting it seems it's getting better and better and so we have to have an eye on this technology but no for synchronizing the wallet i'm pretty sure about it i think that yeah, makes actually. a lot of sense yeah yeah, yeah i i yeah. um that your your point about the multiple servers is, is funny uh yeah I mean, it used to be that you had to trust that the servers don't collude, <laughs> which is kind of a silly assumption. Uh, yeah, yes, we've come it a is. long way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I, I'm really interested in this in this private block explorer thing, and I think it 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 might not be part of Wasabi Wallet, but I think it's obviously part of like an ecosystem of of private Bitcoin. I mean, if you use Wasabi Wallet, but then use a public block explorer you're kind of fucking it up, you know, you're kind of not, uh, you're, you're kind of defeating some of the purpose of the wallet. Uh, so I, I, I hope at least those two things sound kind of complimentary. Um, Sorry. Yes, I, I, I completely agree. In fact, many times we say, okay, how can we, for example, provide more information to the users, right? Mm -hmm. um, because basically a server have a global view of the blockchain while a client has only a local view of the of the of the blockchain right so right, basically right. You, you the client many times can can take advantage of of information that only the server knows but you cannot ask the the server hey can you could you please tell me this because well <laughs> In that case, you are revealing information to the server. So sometimes <laughs> you, you you want to say, okay, how can I ask for this to a central server without revealing my my identity or my my, my intentions, right? So that kind of things 
um, is is something that that's why I say that we have to keep an eye on 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 this on this technology. Yeah, we, so so that's a great point. So 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 I know uh, I'm kind of more familiar. I I have been in cryptography, but not crypto. So I'm I'm kind of like. I uh, was really into Bitcoin in like 2015. I TA'd our our class, and then I like totally checked out. <laughs> um, that's I yeah. So uh, I'm a little unfamiliar. But but what kinds of metadata? What kind of like data do block explorers provide about an address that is kind of that global state? So I can think of like in 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 the like kind of Ethereum version. I can think of like you know I don't know they like. I don't know, some NFT thing, they like pull up some image or, you know, there's like that kind of data. But uh, what are you thinking of uh, that is global that 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 these explorers would show? Well, of course, of course, we we don't know, right? It's IP address, because... Bitcoin address. Ah, I see. Well... So what IP submitted this 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 address? Yep. Okay. Are there um there there's also is there like a kind of uh naming so is there like a DNS equivalent like uh people who use like op return to kind of store data in some kind of structured way to to register a name or whatever. Um that kind of data is also while it's in the transaction the metadata about it is not right. Like maybe to combine the block explorer with a lightning explorer, so you would, for example, see which on-chain transactions are associated to a certain lightning node public key. I see. Yes. So that's information that's not local normally. So today, I guess there's almost no private way to look that up. I guess you just your best bet is to use Tor and to use a public block explorer and be careful. Um, different question, but since Lucas brought up that private information retrieval isn't a new thing, like why is Spiral new or how does it improve upon what came before? Sure, it's a great question. So um, yeah, I mean, there's, so private information retrieval as a problem was posed, yeah, like in the eighties and there's been like a bunch of kind of talk about it, but it never was practical. My best, my my biggest, the thing I always make fun of is like, um, I think IBM had like a big demo where you could look up like the 50 US states privately. And it was like a big demo in 20, you know, I think 2019 or something uh, that the, you could look up 50 states. <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't like a very large database. It was like the capitals of the 50 US states. Um, the the reason we've come a long way and what spiral does does what advancement kind of spiral made was was basically uh just it, it wasn't something super special it was it was a lot of it was the accumulation of a lot of research tricks that like we kind of knew about but hadn't implemented or mm -hmm. just hadn't tried in in the particular way that we did uh, i think we are definitely like the accumulation of years of research rather than like some kind of fundamental like we noticed something that no one else did uh we, we we just brought to bear like a lot of techniques all at once kind of uh very analogously to how zk stuff has has grown for in cryptography you know like years of research from smart people eventually makes some problems you know feasible so yeah um uh, in particular what we really did what we really focused on was making queries smaller so the, the, a big problem with most previous schemes that were efficient on the server side was that then the queries were like hundreds of megabytes. So we we found ways to exploit the fact that, you know, with fully homomorphic encryption, you can compute any function on encrypted data. So we, we kind of, you, we encrypt a function that expands the query. So we can send a very small query and then the server can do work to expand it into a vector. So. That's pretty cool. Yeah, okay, and then somewhat related, but like, how does peer review work for for such a paper? Because it, it seems to me it's not new cryptography, just as you say, applying old concepts, but how was the peer yeah, review Yeah, so, so uh, it's a good question. I remember my advisor was like, yeah, are we, are we, is this going to be kind of like publishable? And we, um, 
we actually after we had that conversation we did come up with some new cryptography so we we did end up kind of uh creating some some new techniques uh, kind of constructing a kind of variation or a change to to old schemes um so we 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 did end up publishing it and and I presented it at, at Oakland which is like the kind of top security conference for for academics so um I think we were in less of a we were not in like a theoretical cryptography venue we were in like a privacy enhancing technologies kind of venue but uh it was still, yeah, I mean, uh, it was a big deal uh, for the reason you pointed out, which is it hasn't been practical. And I think our work was kind of one of, of several works that took it from being impractical to practical. There are there are now a couple, but at the time we were kind of one of the early ones that, uh, yeah, I mean, when we told people, you know, you go to this site and we could read Wikipedia, that was like a big deal because I think everything else had been kind of speculative it was like if you were looking up a sensitive medical condition in theory and if you wanted to you know there were a lot of like mm -hmm. uh, hypotheticals so yeah yeah the mvp demos are pretty great yeah if you have ideas for other ones uh let me know i, I want to do ethereum and i want to do um uh sorry uh the a password checker so I know I don't know if you guys have seen Have I Been Pwned, but they have like oh. a site where you where you put in a password to see if it's been leaked. But you know, of course, you're just giving them your password. They do some hashing and stuff. They 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 say it's okay, but you know, you could do much better with PAR. So I think DNS is mm -hmm. also something we're interested in, although there there are complications there. But uh, yeah, DNS is also exciting. Sorry, this, this is not about the this uh, this topic, right? But just curiosity: uh, how do you how do you see the um, how how um, I don't know how to ask uh, homomorphic encryption? Mm -hmm. How far do you think we are from a fully i mean something that i for example can operate in a in a remote on data on encrypted data in a remote uh, i don't know in for example i save something in google in google drive for yeah, example yeah. right and i can and i can for example i don't know add information to 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 that file to that encrypted file it, it, do you see do you think we we will see something like that? It's a great anytime? question, honestly. Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's a lot of companies. There's a, there's a surprising number of companies trying to do this who will tell you like yes. I I am I take a very I take a fairly pessimistic stance on this. I think something companies are really excited about is encrypted machine learning. What they really want to do is do machine learning on encrypted data. Which, of course, is kind of just like a way of using cryptography to violate your privacy <laughs> instead of uh, using it to... What they want to do is do like machine learning on your encrypted, on your end-to-end -end encrypted photos or your end-to-end -end encrypted, you know, uh, messages. So it's kind of like uh, almost like the, the evil version. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think the good news is those are really impractical. I think it's just like, people in the field know this, but encrypted machine learning is just like, you could do it if you want, but it's really expensive. And it, it, it'll never be, it'll always be like 100 times more expensive than doing it the regular way. So as the regular way gets more expensive and people now want to do like DALI and they want to do GPT-3, like now paying 100 times that cost is is too hard. We're just barely able to do private machine learning from like 2010. So, you know, I, I'm not super optimistic on that front. I, I think something that is really quite realistic that I'm really personally excited about, part of why I'm, I'm founding this company, is I would like to find a way to, to kind of raise money and, and fund the building of metadata private messaging services. So, um, it, can you? The thing I want to build is basically like uh, WhatsApp or or any or Signal, but uh, they don't learn who you talk to. So that is something you can use homomorphic encryption for, and and that is amazing because uh, obviously who you talk to is really sensitive, and if we could hide that data, 
uh, even more than what you say, but also who you who you talk to. Uh, that would be really cool. So so that's an, that's that's something I see as, as as really realistic. And we have to do this foundational work of making PIR practical first. But but once we do that, I think building a messenger. I, I I hope I can in five years tell you, yeah, like you know, you can you can go and and message people, and and uh, the service will never learn who you who you talk to. Yeah. It's pretty sweet. Just a fun fact, but the Signal groups uh, use the Keyed Verified Anonymous Credential Cryptography Scheme that we use for our Wabi Sabi coin joins. So oh, it would okay. be nice if, if now we throw your homomorphic encryption on top and. <laughs> <laughs> so what is that nice called? It's, it's it's a key. What is key? Key verified anonymous credentials. Ah, okay. This so is for I, context or or for or for setup of the conversation. We, we use it as as basically eCash token for access rights. Okay. So the the token gets created on during input registration. And you can only register an output if you present such a token, and it's it's anonymous eCash, so to say. Very rough explanation. Cool. Are, are you familiar with uh, Xiaomi and blind signatures? Xiaomi and blind signatures? Yes, uh, I'm familiar with the name Xiaomi, but uh, no, I haven't heard of uh, Xiaomi and blind signatures. Uh, blind signatures. Probably did a piece set about that, but I did, I could not off the top of my head say what say what exactly it is. It's for voting, right? I think. Yeah. So key verified anonymous credentials are a generalization of the blind signatures. In Wasabi Wallet ah, one point two, we used blind signatures. In two point two, we used key verified anonymous credentials. Oh, so this is actually a homomorphism too. It's it's actually yeah. So if you want to think of it, <laughs> if you want to think of it this way, I mean, uh, you're exploiting a, these signatures also exploit a, a homomorphism in RSA. Uh, they're just it's just a different homomorphism. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. homomorphic encryption is is a little bit of if you want to think of it this way, you could think of it as a generalization of. of it's 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 also a generalization of, of pairings based cryptography. If you've seen that before, there's kind of like that's a very specific homomorphism for ECC. But yeah, yeah, they're they're connected. As, as far as I remember, we we do use uh, Patterson commitments, or, or generally speaking, homomorphic encryption for the amount of the value of of these credentials. Ah, okay. Um, yes. Yeah. So those are again, yes. yeah, homomorphic. Right. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yes, because we have to, to uh, the server needs to verify that the operation that we realized with the amounts um, are correct without knowing the amounts themselves. So, yes, but it's something, I mean, I, I, I don't know what, uh, I don't know exactly how to define homomorphic encryption, right? Um, because homomorphic encryption, like in the concept, is it's 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 okay, but it it, it sounds like something that is not still possible, right? <laughs> so, yeah. homomorphic in, um, homomorphic encryption, yeah, and the scope is this. For most of the time, it's something like what we what we do is basically, or we operate in a in a, in a, yes, in a better commit, committed uh, value, and that value is basically a, a, a point in a, an elliptic curve, and that's it. It's it's funny. I I think uh, elliptic curves are way more complicated. I'm always I'm always like, I think uh, lattice based cryptography and homomorphic stuff, which is which is lattice based, and you know was initially pioneered for post quantum resistance and stuff. I think it's way easier to understand than elliptic curves. Cause like, you know, what is an elliptic curve really? You know, I'm always like very confused, not confused, but it, it's always very abstract for me. Whereas uh, lattices are just, you know, it's matrices and it's noise. And I understand that a lot better. It's like a lot easier for me. So it's, it's funny. You should, you guys are, you guys are real crypto people. If you guys are just 
sitting around thinking about Pennerson commitments and homomorphisms. <laughs> and yeah. uh, <laughs> I, I, I promise homomorphic encryption is, is, uh, is also, is, is in some ways much easier to understand. So, yeah. Uh, we we are not crypto cryptographers here. We, I mean, we, we are. We, but, yes, I, I, if we it have looks to, like a duck and talks like a duck. I don't know. You guys are guys are as much cryptographers as as, as anyone, I think. Self <laughs> self taught cryptographers. <laughs> <laughs> the most dangerous uh -huh. kind. Uh, oh, yes, yes. It's true. I, I suppose so, academic cryptographers are less dangerous. You know, I think we mostly write papers and then that's it. <laughs> so to be fair, we hired a cryptographer uh, for, 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 for this. So, <laughs> so that's okay. But he's not <laughs> here. Yeah, plus we, we didn't roll our own crypto, but we're script kiddies and, and just copied it from an existing paper. So should be all right. <laughs> yeah, well, I that's what know. a cryptographer would do, right? That's that's exactly, <laughs> they would say, we're not going to roll our own. We're going to get a library, right? So we did the right I thing. I mean, we kind of did roll, right? Like, we wrote a lot of cryptographic code. Yep, did not use a library. But at least Lucas. the concepts we didn't roll. Lucas, would you say we rolled our own crypto or not? Uh, ah, good, good question. I, mm, no, I mean, the, the crypto that we are using is just a, a, a very uh, specific case of the one more general case that is the one that uh, describes the signal, the... the the signal white paper for for anonymous groups. So they have a general case and we use only one specific case of that. So we, we are not doing that. Now, the problem is in the, in the implementation. I mean, the code, someone has to write the code, right? <laughs> uh, and, and that is where developers always make mistakes, huge mistakes. Um, but so, yes, we implemented that because there are no libraries for that. There is no, it's not, I mean, it's so basically, let's say we implemented our own crypto library, right? Um, however, the good part is that in my case, at least I made so many mistakes before that I think I, I learned by doing and by mi making mistakes uh, and, and, and also the code is extremely reviewed and uh, so I think we did it really, really well this time. Samir, do you still have time or are we just boring you at I this have, point? I have uh, about uh, 10 or 15 more minutes if you guys want to keep chatting. Cool. Well, most important questions first, guys. What do you have for Samir for the next fifteen? So, how about a big one? Um, all right, go ahead, Jumar. <laughs> you have to bring a big one now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Uh, this is a, a one question that I've been meaning to ask is that um, given that uh, the homomor homomorphic encryption has addition and multiplication, uh, as far as I know about uh, abstract algebra, does that enable uh, um, Turing complete machines or computations? Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's what the, uh, sometimes you see this abbreviated as fully homomorphic encryption. That's what the fully means. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, you can do arbitrary computation. Uh, encrypted. Anything you can compute on on regular data, it's possible to compute on encrypted data. Yeah, I see. Uh, so, so you can uh, uh, in, in in a hypothetical scenario, how how does one implement? For say, you know, in Boolean logic, they say um, the NAND gate yeah, yeah, is yeah, a good yeah. uh, How yes. does that going to translate into homomorphic operations? Yeah, so um, there are some homomorphic schemes that actually operate directly on the bit level. So, so they actually implement a NAND gate uh, in the scheme, basically. In fact, the scheme basically just 
is a way to compute a homomorphic NAND game. And then everything else just goes from there. Um, something to note, I guess, about the fully part of fully homomorphic encryption, something we didn't, we kind of mentioned, but uh, this, the homomorphic encryption that Spiral uses is bounded depth. What that means is like there's a certain depth of the computation of the circuit that you can compute. Uh, and then after that, it doesn't work. Uh, so um, that that kind of bounded depthness is is not fully homomorphic, right? You can't do anything Turing complete in, in bounded depth. So there is a kind of encryption, a homomorphic encryption that can do arbitrary, arbitrarily large and arbitrary computation. So, so that is that is fully homomorphic encryption. Um, and it exists. Uh, we don't we don't use that that part of it because it's uh, quite slow. <laughs> but uh, it does exist. It is possible. Uh, I, I don't suppose you can make uh, uh, <laughs> a mini computer out of uh, fully homomorphic. No, oh, yeah, you absolutely can. In fact, uh, people are working on it for 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 rollups and stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's possible. Yeah. Uh, if I may ask Fabricio, uh, is is that implementable in lookup tables and you know um, FPGAs and stuff? Yeah, it's not Actually, that amenable to hardware acceleration. You you preceded me was was the question I was was going to ask if the, the implementation <laughs> on FPGAs or or ASICs is uh, could constitute yeah. a a significant improvement. And it's a great uh, question. Yeah. So, so we've 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 actually tried GPUs, and GPUs are are really well suited for this. Um, Nvidia actually has like an instruction set extension and a library that they they put out that that helps you do this. So uh, it's not. Uh, I think they might have. Yeah, I don't know what the status of it is, but they are thinking about this. Um, A6 and FPGAs are kind of not very useful because you need what, what you need is you need a fairly significant amount of memory because the database needs to fit in memory and uh, GPUs have a lot of effort invested in really, really good memory access. Right. So uh, actually GPUs are kind of optimal. Um, we, we, we tried it. it at the time GPUs were really expensive. <laughs> so we actually, it didn't become cost effective. It, it was, it was cool and it was, it was fast, but it wasn't very cost effective. Now, <laughs> now that, GPUs are way cheaper. It, it might be. <laughs> I have to uh, I'll have to like revisit it. But yeah, yeah. Actually, a question because you just said the database has to be kept in memory. Like, is that the case in Spiral? Yes. Oh, okay. But then, I mean, if we have a large data data set, with, for example, the full blockchain, you know, many hundreds of gigabytes. Right. The, all of that needs to be in memory. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it does. I I will say the memory cost usually kind of pales in t in terms of in in comparison to the compute cost. So I mean, uh, making everything fit in memory is, I mean, hundreds of gigs of mem memory is like on a cloud provider, not that expensive actually. And once once you have uh, some everything fitting in memory, I mean, you can throw as many compute cores as you want at it. So it's it's uh yeah, it's a limit, but it's not, yeah, it's not crazy. Um. Out of topic question for Fabricio. Um, um, I've been quite interested in FPGA development. Uh, what's this? Have you looked into the um, uh, open source um, hardware uh, Verilog synthesis stuff like um, iStorm or something? Ah, sorry, um, project S starts with that or S, I forgot. <laughs> Uh, but actually, these are crypto project regarding FPGA because actually I'm dealing with FPGA for uh, actually for genomic recognition. Uh, but um, actually, regarding crypto, I, I actually I didn't look uh, yet. Let's say, but uh, actually. If you, let's say, regarding, for example, the, the, the primitive function uh, to, for example, do do hashing stuff or uh, cryptographic primitives, uh, I think you you can improve probably one order of magnitude if you if you implement some 
some crypto cryptographic computation and, and hashing on, on on FPGAs. This is something that I think is uh, is uh, worth looking at. Definitely. Cool. Um, last question for you. Um, has it been uh, feasible, um, given that, uh, is it been, you know, in uh, FPGAs, you are bound with like a manufacturer's, um, you know, tooling. And lately there has been some developments regarding open source um, um, tooling for like Yosis and stuff. Uh, have you used those tools before or is it still uh, vendor locked? Uh, well, at the moment, we, we are using proper, proprietary tools. Uh, for example, uh, Vivado, oh, which is uh, very, uh, very, one very famous, but actually, uh, no, actually didn't yet look at the, let's say, open source, uh, open source development uh, regarding that. I will have a look. For sure. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you very much for for coming here. That was uh, really kind of yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks so much for. I, I'm. I learned so much. I'm. I'm learning so much about what what Bitcoin people want and need and stuff. And you guys are super helpful. So thank you so much. I. Uh, I want to. The only thing I want to say is, you know, let's let's keep in touch, especially as we get closer to building something that looks less like just a balance checker and more like a private block explorer. Mm -hmm. I would love to see if, if there's kind of a synergy between what we offer. I would love mm -hmm. to see if like people who use Wasabi Wallet also want to like use a private block explorer. So um, yeah, if that sounds good, I would, I would love to keep in touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially if, 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 if you run the server and we don't have to, and we can use it for, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, we we can use it for small niche things like finding out the amount of the the input of a payment transaction so that we can yeah. debump it. You know, these yeah. types of small things where it doesn't really make sense for us to make huge infrastructure changes for those very, very niche case things. No, um, we'd, we'd love to. We'd love to mostly, we'd love to see people use the server. We'd love to see like what your pain points are. We're, we're absolutely happy to host and run those kinds of things. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, pretty sweet, and I'm yeah really curious what we can come up with to use this other than just just blockchain sync and and, and wallet balance sync. Yeah, um, yeah. Pretty cool. Just sorry, just one comment. You you know it's not obvious what uh, we can do with this technology. I, I don't know if everybody understands. In fact, the, uh, I think the, the the white paper is not a good uh, starting point for. <laughs> in fact, it's mm -hmm. the <laughs> Yeah, you know, so, uh, so it, it, it sometimes uh, y, y, you need to know the tools that you have, have uh, available. Yeah. So when when you say, okay, we can fix the oh, there is this technology that we can use, and this is exactly for this. So right, right. If, if you have documentation or or presentations or examples or snippets or whatever or use cases yeah, yeah. or Right, uh, mm -hmm. that's that, that's also cool. I I'm pretty interested in on, on, on this yeah. stuff. I will definitely send you guys that stuff. It, I, you're totally right. You have to kind of know what the tool is before you can really see where it where it makes sense to use. Absolutely. Okay, thank you guys. Yeah, then I guess that's that's it for the recorded part of of this week's Wasabi Research Club. Thanks for all the guests joining us here and all the viewers online. Hopefully this was as exciting and useful for you guys as it was for me. Um, again, thanks Samir for, for coming here. Uh, real pleasure, real honor. Let's stay in touch. Yeah, absolutely. And Thank you so much. See you on the next show. Bye-bye. Yeah, see you.